So we're starting this brand new series called Director's Chair. And as you can see on stage, we have a director's chair. Let me uh, tell you a little secret. I don't tell many people this. I've done a good job hiding any trace of it on the internet, so good luck trying to back this up. Uh, but in my younger days, uh, when I was about seven, eight, and nine years old, I, um, I was a childhood actor. Uh, I was in enough commercials and movies and things like that that I'm actually a member of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, things you just learned about your lead pastor. So yeah, um, I, uh, one time I had an opportunity. I was the, the main part in a movie that filmed in Italy. So my mom and I, I got to, this is the coolest thing. I was in third grade and I got to leave school for two months. Awesome. I, that's the only thing I think I was excited about. I'm like, wait, I don't have to go to school for two months? So for two months, we flew to Italy to film a, a movie. And all of these sort of things, the director's chair, the clapper, the lights, all that was very much a real experience in three years of my childhood. And there's a person who sits in the director's chair. What do we call them? The director. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, one thing, though, I've learned in our, our existence, in our life, is there is also a director's chair in your life. There is, uh, there's a director. Now, the Bible here, as we're going to go into this series, director's chair, we're going to be looking through the book of Colossians. We're going to walk the next four weeks through the book of Colossians, and Colossians does an incredible job pointing out a, a very simple truth that Christ alone is supreme that Christ alone is the director it doesn't really matter who you let sit in the chair in your life there is a director and his name is Christ the problem is that oftentimes we put other people in his chair you know on a set that director he, he sits right by the audio, the main audio guy, and he, anytime he wants, he can listen to everything that's happening in the room and how the sound is being mixed. And he's got screens over here to see the different angles and the different cameras and what they're capturing. And he literally, uh, or she is literally calling the shots. You know, I, oh, I moved this camera down and roll that one a little slower and, and directing the actors on stage on what they need to do and what they should say and how they should do it. And we have the same concept in our lives. We have someone that we're allowing to call the shots. The problem with the church in Colossae is there was, there was some heresy within the church. A little background, Paul and Timothy were in prison together when this letter was written. Paul and Timothy, if you want to have an idea about how serious Timothy took his discipleship, he went to prison with his discipler for their faith. And they're in prison together, and they hear about what's happening in the church in Colossae. They can't leave prison and go there to address it themselves, so they write a letter. And there was this, there was this heresy, this, this idea that had crept into the church in Colossae that, that caused Paul to want to write this, this letter, and the heresy was something like this. It was Jesus plus something. In order to really embrace grace, or in order to, to have salvation, in order to, to earn God's favor or forgiveness, you need Jesus plus this other thing. And oftentimes this other thing is what we have sitting in our director's chair. It might be uh, maybe an idea from the world. Maybe it's a, another a faith system or another worldview, and you have this other thing. You're like, yeah, yeah, I believe Jesus is important, but also what about this other idea? I think that's probably a piece of the puzzle too. Or maybe you're allowing some other person or other people to speak truth into your life, and they're the ones calling the shots. Maybe it's you. Maybe you've uh, gotten off the stage and found yourself backstage, and you're sitting in the director's chair telling yourself what to do. And that's what was happening in the church of Colossae. The problem is this, is that if you deserve grace, that's not grace. If, if God it loves you because of something you did, or, or loves you because of something you didn't do that was bad, 
That's, that's not the way it works. That's not grace. That's, that's Jesus plus something. Here's the truth. Jesus loves you because Jesus loves you. Jesus plus nothing. And Paul cared so much about this church that he wanted to, to write them this letter to say, hey, there's, there's a lot of people in your lives vying for the, the, the role of who's calling the shots. And you've got to get all of those things out of the director's chair and put the director back into that role in your life. So, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the game Musical Chairs, right? At first, the, the concept is pretty simple. You're all moving around. You don't really know which chair is going to be the one that two people are fighting over. But when it gets down to the very end and there is one chair left, the strategy is very, very crucial in this moment, right? You want to make sure that you go behind the chair very fast and very slow when you're in front of the chair. You know what I'm talking about, right? You want to make sure that when the music stops, the, the odds are in your favor. So it's one of these things right here. Because at the end, there are two people that are always going to end up fighting. There's going to be two butts in one seat. And that's not the way the game was designed to be played, right? So what happens is there's a fight over this chair. This is the same that's true of this, of this heresy. There is only room for one person to be calling the shots in your life. And so often... We play this game of musical chairs where we're like, oh, maybe there's room for both of us here. Maybe there's room for Jesus and something else calling the shots in my life. And I want to break that down today. Simply put, look up here, there there is a chair. If that's that's your takeaway today, if you're like, hey, all I really learned from Matt today is that there is a chair a position of authority over my life. There's someone. It's, it's Jesus that I allow to call the shots or it's myself who's calling the shots or it's somebody else in my life who's calling the shots. There is a chair and there's only room for one person to be calling the shots from that position. I want to pray and ask God to, to bless this time of teaching. Uh, by now, the booth in the back, you already know I'm not going off my notes today. Uh, I preached off my notes first service and I didn't like it. So we're, uh, we're doing something a little different. Let's, uh, let's pray together. God, I, I ask that you would, God, you would teach. Father, I pray that the words that I say would be the words that you want to communicate to your church. That each of us would, would recognize the, the value and, and understanding that there is only room for one person directing our lives. And God, we recognize you, most of us in this room, We know that you're the director, but we still are taking direction from so many other sources. And I ask that you would point that out to us, help us to see that, see the truth behind it, and and ultimately recognize how we need to place you back into the director's chair of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you a little incentive to come back next week for our second part of this series. If you come back next week, I will show a little snippet of that movie from Italy. Uh, Very small one, because I don't like much of it at all. Um, Hey, uh, I assume uh, some of you in this room, I I saw something on my Facebook feed this week. And when I first saw it, what I saw was different than what my wife saw. And uh, maybe some of you have seen this. Maybe some of you have not. Let me put this picture up on the screen for you. Uh, right here. Anybody see this on their Facebook feed this week? Just a few of you. All right, those of you who haven't, it's coming. It's coming. You'll see it this week. Here's the question, is what color are these shoes? Now, you remember about six years ago, we had the whole, the whole dress fiasco, right? What color was the dress? And, and now that's happening again. This popped up on my Facebook feed, and I don't know, maybe it's not fair in this context because the white is awfully white, and I still see. When I look at this picture, let me just tell you what I see. I see pink and white shoes. Anyone with me? All right. Uh, some people see gray and teal, apparently. Any gray and teal in the room? Gray and teal? 
Okay, well, when you see it, maybe not in this context, when you're looking at it, it tends to be about a 50-50 split. And it's causing, uh, man, my, my wife and I, no, we didn't get in a fight over it. But we, here's what happened. It showed up on my screen the first time, and I said, well, that's clearly pink and white. And my wife said, no, it's clearly gray and teal. And we, we didn't see it the same way. We, we had a, a misunderstanding. And then later in the day, it popped up on my Facebook feed again. And I said, okay. Now someone went and changed it to gray and teal. Who's playing a trick on me? And he, he, just within the matter of a couple you know, hours, I saw this picture. My eyes, for whatever reason, saw it a totally different way. And, and here, here's the problem. If you understand the truth of Colossians chapter 1, which the theme of Colossians chapter 1 is this, that Jesus is supreme. In other words, Jesus is the director. If that truth needs to, in order to fully understand and embrace that truth, we have to ask ourselves a very important question, and it's this. Who is Jesus? If you walk out of here and you said, listen, Matt told me that Jesus is the one who should be sitting in the director's chair, and yet you don't know who Jesus is, then, then we're going to have, you know, that, that's not very helpful to you. I feel like I've dropped the ball. And some of us are going to see things differently. Some of us are going to see pink and white. Some of us are going to see gray and teal. The problem is also with Jesus. When I talk about Jesus, some of us in this room right now, you understand Jesus to be something different than how I see Jesus. And yet there's even a third or fourth person in this room who sees Jesus different than the rest of us. There's all sorts of different ways that we view Jesus. So if I'm saying that Jesus is the one who ought to be in the director's chair of your life. If Paul is telling the church in Colossae, it's Jesus plus nothing. Put him in the seat that was meant for him. Then we have to ask ourselves this most important question. Who is Jesus? Muslims believe that Jesus uh, was a prophet. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Mormons believe that God and Mary had a physical sexual relationship and that Jesus was the offspring and that you can be uh, an offspring of God's, you can be a God too, just like Jesus was. A liberal theologian believes that Jesus was a good teacher. Uh, Potentially, he's a way to God, but he's not the way to God. You see, there's so many different ways to answer this question. Even in the Bible, we see people often asking this question. Do you remember when Jesus was asleep on the boat and there was a storm and and all of his disciples were freaking out, right? They, They went and they woke him up and they said, Jesus, what are you doing sleeping? And Jesus got up and he said, hush. And the whole storm just stopped. It calmed in a moment. And then they asked this question. They said, who is this that even the weather obeys his commands? They asked this question. They said, who is Jesus? There was another instance where uh, there was friends who, who lowered their paralyzed friend through the roof of a house so that Jesus could heal him. And instead of Jesus saying, uh, just simply, you're healed, he said, hey, get up, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees in that moment said, whoa, 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 who who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. And all throughout Scripture, as Jesus is doing his thing, people are asking this question, who is this? At one point, Jesus even asks his disciples, who are people saying I am? How are people answering this question? And here's what I want you to know. This is the most important question you will ever have to answer. I'm going to say that again for dramatic dramatic effect. Getting this question right is the most important thing, I believe, the, the most important question you will ever answer in your life. Who is Jesus? Let's uh, turn to Colossians and explore this truth together. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one in the chair back in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, you can take that Bible, write your name on it, and take it home with you. We, We love the Bible at ACC so much, we want you to own a copy of it. So take that as a gift from us to you. Colossians is a a, a letter, 
in the New Testament, you'll find the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Acts, and then Romans. And then you'll find First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. So if you just keep, if you find any of those books I just mentioned, keep flipping a little bit further, and you will find Colossians. In my Bible here, it's on page 711, which should be easy to remember. All right, page 711. I'm going to start reading. I'm going to skip down to verse 15. And here's what it says. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Ultimately, what that verse is saying is Christ isn't just someone who looks like God. It says he is the visible image of an invisible God. In other words, if you want to know how God would treat sinners, just look how Jesus treated sinners. If you want to know if Jesus or if God cares about the poor and the sick, just look at Jesus and how he handled the poor and the sick. Jesus is the visible image of an invisible God. Let's keep reading. It says, He existed before anything was created and was supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Listen, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. I just don't want you to miss how impactful and powerful and matter-of-fact every one of these statements are. It says again in verse 16, uh, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him, and for him. You know what's really important to understand in that claim right there is that Jesus was there at the beginning. Jesus is also outside of, of time and space. Jesus was there as we, were, we sang that song at the very beginning of all creation. Jesus was present in that moment. Not only was everything created for him, all of it was created by him. Jesus is over all creation. You keep reading. Verse 17, it says, He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Colossae was known for having a lot of earthquakes. Uh, you could find uh, the original city of Colossae is now in modern-day Turkey. And in that realm, in that area of the earth, there are earthquakes that happen all the time. And what would happen because of the earthquakes, the people in Colossae, remember, they had bought into this Jesus plus something. They liked to add something else on top of Jesus. And the thing that they would do because of the earthquakes that would happen in Colossae, they, they had another god. Uh, she, I think her name was Sabo or Sabu, uh, but she was ultimately like Mother Nature. So the people in Colossae worshipped God, they understood about Jesus. They, m many of them had given their lives to Jesus, but then they had bought into this heresy, oh, uh, the earth is shaking. Uh, we must have made Mother Nature upset too. Let's uh, provide a sacrifice or something for her. And remember, Jesus plus something. So Paul writes this, and he says, listen, he existed before everything else, and he holds everything together. There is no Jesus plus anything in creation. Verse 18, it says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning supreme. We can replace that word with director. He is the director over all who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. Y'all, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're allowing Jesus to sit in the director's chair in your life whether or not you're allowing him to call the shots in your life. The Bible's very clear. He is the director. In fact, you even look back at the fact that he was over all creation. You could even infer he's the producer. Verse 19, it says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Here's what verse 19 means in real plain English. Jesus is God. 
Jesus is God. Now, many of you in this room, if I just said, who's heard of Jesus? Every hand in this room would probably go up. We've all, you know, we've, we're, uh, most of us maybe have been around enough people that we've heard of Jesus. So all of us would say, yeah, I've heard of Jesus. But now you go making a claim that Jesus is God, I assume I've lost a few of you. I'm not going to actually ask you to put your hands up, but some of you in this room would say, hmm, you can't go that far. I'm not, gonna, I'm not willing to go so far as to claim that Jesus is God. Let's keep reading. Colossians 1, verses 20 and 20, uh, through 22, it says this, And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. I'm gonna, I, I, I want to slow down here for a moment. These three verses are so powerful in what's crammed into three short verses that I feel like I just read that too fast. I'm going to go back. I'm going to start at the, the beginning again. Uh, verse 20 it says, And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes, get this, you, me, who were once far away from from God. He's going to pick on us again. You ready? You and me were his enemies, separated from him by our evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, turn the page, right? Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you no longer are an enemy of God, you are now called holy and blameless as you stand before Him without a single fault. Have you lost the awe of what Jesus has done for you? The Bible is very, very clear here. There wasn't peace before Christ. It says that you and I were enemies of God. There's, there's only two ways to bring peace when you have an enemy. One way is to annihilate the enemy. You go in and you annihilate the enemy and now there's peace because there's no one threatening you anymore. They're gone. They're done. Christ could have gone that route. He could have brought peace by just ending it. But there's another way to bring peace within, your, within a, a context of an enemy relationship and that is to befriend them. It's to to turn away from this concept of of an enemy type relationship. Instead, I'm going to go and I'm going to present this this offering and this sacrifice and I'm going to redeem them and draw them back to myself and I'm going to bring peace by sacrificing my son on the cross for these sinners. So another thing we know about Jesus is that Jesus isn't just God, but Jesus is the Savior. Paul couldn't be any clearer. I think what happens sometimes is many people in this room, you might have been, you might still be hands up. Yeah, I believe Jesus is God. But the moment I say that Jesus is the, I get really exclusive here and say Jesus is the Savior, the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father except through Christ. The moment I get that exclusive, It starts to make people want to lower their hands. Listen, I believe that Jesus is great. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, but I I don't know if I'd go so far as to say he is the only way back to the Father. Listen, if Jesus isn't the only way back to the Father, why would he have had to die on the cross the way he did? That would have been an incredibly foolish decision if there was a lot of other ways that it could have gone down. There is only one way to be reconciled back to the Father, and that is Jesus. 
Now, you might still uh, not be willing to raise your hand. I might have lost some of you on that, but I'm going I'm to keep going here for a moment. I want you to know this one truth, that only people who recognize their need for a Savior receive a Savior. Colossians 1.23 says, But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. You see what Paul calls himself? In light of the fact that he sees that Jesus is God, and he also sees that Jesus is the Savior, because he has recognized those things, now he's making another claim here at the end. He says, and now I have been appointed as God's, say it with me, servant. That brings us to another definition of who is Jesus. Jesus is Lord, and we are his servants. Now, I, I think that if I asked people to, to raise their hands, if, hey, are we still tracking? Are we still on the same page about who Jesus is? Most of us in this room, the fact that you're in a church on a Sunday morning, you're probably, on average, we're probably going to have most hands up in the air. I'm not going to ask you to do that. But here's what I really want to challenge your mind with. Who is really sitting in the director's chair of your life? You say, I believe that Jesus is my Lord and that I am his servant. We say things like, Jesus is my Savior, but I still want to hang on to this one sin issue in my life. I'm not willing to give up on that. Jesus is my Savior, but I want to sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. Jesus is my Savior, but I, I still want to direct my life. I still want to call the shots in my life. You know, there's a, a debate sometimes within the church. Hey, should you tithe post-tax or pre-tax? You know, I, I've kind of given up on this argument, and I just tell people, who cares? You're not tithing anyway. <laughs> this is concept. Listen, if we have placed Christ into the director's chair of our life, it doesn't really matter what he has to say or how he's planning to direct us or if what he wants us to do is rational or makes sense to us or we like it. It doesn't matter if he is the Lord and we are his servant, we're going to follow him. We're going to allow the director to direct. So while it's easy to say, yes, I believe Jesus is my Lord, when you really understand what that statement is saying, it means Jesus is my director. And I do things his way. And when I don't, and I got to take a, a take two or a take three or a take four, I recognize that I got I to gotta get it right this next time because Jesus is the one directing my life. There's a conversation that has to happen sometimes in a relationship called a, a DTR. It stands for defining the relationship. Those of you who are maybe dating or have dated recently, this, this phrase, defining the relationship, what it means is at some point you've been dating long enough or you've been hanging out long enough that you eventually have to sit down and have a difficult conversation of, so what is this? Is this going anywhere? I remember with my wife and I, we had this conversation at one point. I, I had already assumed we were like exclusive boyfriend and girlfriend. So I have this, I'm like, we're, we're like boyfriend and girlfriend, right? And she's like, uh, hold, hold back a little bit. This was like a theme throughout our relationship. When we were finally dating and we were exclusive at one point, I said to my wife, I said, Melissa, the first time I said this, right? Melissa, I, I, I love you. She said, thanks. <laughs> now we've been married 16 years. And um, 16 years this summer. I'm rounding up. Um, 
We sometimes in a relationship, when your relationship lasts a long time, you can, you can fall into a trap of taking your partner for granted. The promises you made on day one, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be in this relationship, you know, God's calling me to be like Jesus and for you to be like the church and I'm going to love you the way Jesus loves you. This is a promise that I made easily on day one and over time, sometimes those things, you start to take each other for granted. I don't ever want my wife to be a housekeeper I don't ever want my wife to be a child care provider for me. Um, she's not a prostitute who just meets my sexual needs. She's my wife. And I made a commitment to, to honor that relationship. It had to be defined. And in your faith, you have to ask yourself this question. Who is Jesus? What is relationship are you going to have with him do you believe that he was just a great guy do you believe that he is god do you believe that he is the savior and more importantly are you allowing that jesus to direct your life are you submitting to him as the lord of your life and and submitting to yourself to to being his servant so that's the so what i want to leave us with I want to process this, this thought with you. I want to ask each of you this morning, maybe this morning isn't enough time and you need to ask yourself this question in the car ride home. Maybe you need to get home and you need to spend some time on your knees. But I want you to ask this question, who is Jesus to me? I want you to define your relationship. You know those, that picture of those shoes I put up? I looked them up. It doesn't really matter what you think or what I think. They're pink and white. <laughs> About the, the question of who is Jesus, again, it doesn't really matter what you think or what I think. He is God. He is your Savior, if you allow Him to be. And He wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants to sit in the director's chair of your life. One day, whether by just pure adoration or by force, the Bible says that every single person in this room will recognize and know the truth to that question. It says every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and every one of us will recognize that Jesus is the Lord. If you don't already know that and haven't defined your relationship to that extreme yet, I want to challenge you to define that relationship today. Maybe some of you, you've been following Christ. You invited Christ to be in your life a long time ago. But you aren't allowing him to call the shots. You've kicked him out of the director's chair and you're the one deciding what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Fix that today. Maybe you've never invited Jesus to be the savior of your life. You've never acknowledged that he was God for you. I want to give you an opportunity to take care of that today also. So what I want to do is we're going to sing another song. And if, if during this song you want to respond in some way, you just want, maybe you just want someone to pray with you. Maybe you've decided you want to submit. Uh, and, and, and maybe on May 20th you want to get baptized. Would you take and be courageous and stand up? And on this side of the stage over here and on this side of the stage over here, I'm going to ask uh, our overseers, or our prayer team, or our staff to be willing to meet with you here. Uh, while we worship together. Why don't you stand with us and let's worship and sing this song together.